Welcome to Learn and Gaming, where we explore fascinating ideas at the intersection of science, philosophy, and the human experience. Today, we're diving into a mind-bending concept known as the Doomsday Argument. Now, before you start envisioning asteroids hurtling towards Earth or zombie apocalypses, let me assure you, this is a different kind of doomsday scenario. It's one rooted in probability and statistics, and it might just change the way you think about our species' future. The doomsday argument was first proposed by astrophysicist Brandon Carter in 1983, and later expanded upon by philosophers John Leslie and Richard Gott. At its core, it's a probabilistic argument that attempts to predict the likelihood of human extinction based on a fascinating premise. That we are randomly selected observers within the total population of humans who will ever live. Now, I know what you're thinking. Random observers? Total population of humans who will ever live. What does that even mean? Don't worry, we're gonna break this down step by step. Let's start with the concept of random selection. Imagine for a moment that you're reaching into a giant cosmic hat that contains the names of every human being who has ever lived and who will ever live. You pull out a name at random, and surprise, it's you. This is essentially what the doomsday argument asks us to consider. It posits that we can think of ourselves as randomly selected individuals from the set of all humans who will ever exist. Now, here's where things get interesting. If you were indeed randomly selected from this set, Statistically speaking, you're more likely to be somewhere in the middle of that set rather than at the very beginning or the very end. This is the crux of what's known as Carter's observation, named after Brandon Carter. To understand this better, let's use an analogy. Imagine you're in a long line at a theme park, but you have no idea how long the line is because you can't see the end. However, you do know your position in the line. Let's say you're the 100th person. Now, based on this information alone, would you guess that there are 10,000 people in line behind you or just 50? Statistically, it's more likely that there are fewer people behind you than an enormous number. This is essentially what the doomsday argument is doing, but on a much grander scale. Instead of a theme park line, we're talking about the entire timeline of human existence. And instead of your position in line, we're talking about your birth rank. That is, what number human are you in the grand scheme of all humans who will ever live? Now, let's dive a bit deeper into how this argument actually works. The doomsday argument employs something called Bayesian reasoning. Don't let the fancy term intimidate you. Bayesian reasoning is simply a way of updating our beliefs based on new evidence. In this case, we're using our birth rank as evidence to make inferences about the total number of humans who will ever exist. Here's how it works. We know that approximately 100 billion humans have been born so far in our species history. Let's say your birth rank is 90 billion. That means you're one of the most recent humans to be born out of all humans so far. Now, if we assume a uniform distribution, that is, if we assume you're equally likely to be born at any point in human history, then there's a 95% probability that you're within the middle 95% of all humans who will ever live. This is where the argument gets its predictive power. If you're in the middle 95%, then the total number of humans who will ever live can't be enormously larger than the number who have already been born. Let's put some numbers to this to make it clearer. If your birth rank is 90 billion, and you're in the middle 95% of all humans who will ever live, then the total number of humans is likely to be between about 95 billion and 1.8 trillion. That might sound like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it suggests that humanity might not have a very long future ahead in terms of population size and longevity. Now, I can already hear some of you questioning this. Wait a minute. You might be thinking, how can we make predictions about the future based on such a simple statistical argument? And you'd be right to question it. The doomsday argument has sparked intense debate and controversy since it was first proposed. Oh, first One of the main criticisms of the doomsday argument is that it misuses something called the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle states that any observations we make about the universe are biased by the necessity of our existence as observers. In other words, we can only observe a universe that's capable of producing us in the first place. Critics argue that the doomsday argument takes this principle too far. They say it's not valid to consider ourselves as randomly selected observers because our very existence is contingent on a specific set of circumstances. We couldn't have been born at just any point in human history. We're products of our specific time and place. 
Another major criticism of the doomsday argument is the issue of sampling bias. The argument assumes that we're drawing a random sample from the set of all humans who will ever live. But is this really an accurate reflection of real-world conditions? After all, we're not actually pulling names out of a cosmic hat. Our existence at this particular point in history is the result of a complex series of events and circumstances. Then there's the assumption of randomness itself. The doomsday argument assumes that your birth rank is random and not influenced by other factors. But is this really the case? We know that human population growth has not been uniform throughout history. There have been periods of rapid growth and periods of decline. How does this affect the validity of the argument? Another interesting criticism is what's known as the reference class problem. This asks the question, what's the appropriate group to consider when we're making these calculations? Should we be looking at all humans who have ever lived? Or should we focus on a specific subset, say, humans living in modern times? The choice of reference class can significantly affect the outcome of the argument. These criticisms highlight the complexity of the doomsday argument and the challenges in applying probabilistic reasoning to such a grand-scale question as the future of humanity. But even with these criticisms, the argument continues to fascinate and provoke thought among philosophers, scientists, and anyone interested in pondering our species' future. Now, let's take a step back and consider the implications of the doomsday argument if we were to accept its premises. What would it mean for us as a species? First and foremost, it suggests that humanity might not have as long a future ahead of us as we might hope or expect. If we accept the argument's conclusion, it implies that we're more likely to be living closer to the end of human history than the beginning. This could be interpreted in various ways. It could mean that we face extinction sooner than we think, or it could mean that our population will decline dramatically in the near future. But before you start stockpiling supplies for the apocalypse, it's important to remember that the doomsday argument is just that, an argument. It's a thought experiment based on probability and statistics, not a concrete prediction of the future. It doesn't take into account the myriad factors that could influence human population growth or decline, nor does it consider the potential for technological advancements that could dramatically alter our species' trajectory. That being said, the doomsday argument does serve as a sobering reminder of our species' vulnerability. It encourages us to think critically about our long-term survival and the challenges we face as a species. Climate change, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, asteroid impacts, these are all very real threats that could potentially bring about the kind of doomsday scenario the argument suggests is more likely than we might think. In this light, we could view the doomsday argument as a call to action. If there's even a small chance that it's correct, Shouldn't we be doing everything in our power to ensure our species' long-term survival? This could mean redoubling our efforts to combat climate change, investing in space exploration and planetary defense systems, or working towards global cooperation to reduce the risk of nuclear war. But the implications of the doomsday argument aren't all doom and gloom. In fact, it can be seen as a testament to how far we've come as a species. The fact that we can even contemplate these kinds of grand, Cosmic questions is a reflection of our intellectual and technological progress. We're at a point in our history where we can not only ponder our place in the universe but also actively work towards shaping our future. Moreover, the doomsday argument encourages us to appreciate the present moment. If we truly are closer to the end of human history than the beginning, doesn't that make our time here all the more precious? It's a reminder to value our experiences, our relationships, and our impact on the world around us. Now, let's take a moment to consider some of the philosophical implications of the doomsday argument. One of the most interesting aspects of this thought experiment is how it challenges our perception of time and our place in history. We often think of ourselves as living at the dawn of a new era. We look at our technological progress, our scientific understanding, and we imagine a future stretching out infinitely before us. The doomsday argument asks us to consider a different perspective. What if we're not at the beginning of human history, but somewhere in the middle or even towards the end? This shift in perspective can be profoundly unsettling. It challenges our notion of progress and our assumptions about the future. But it can also be liberating. If we're not at the beginning of a long journey, but rather in the thick of it, doesn't that give added weight and significance to our actions here and now? 
The doomsday argument also raises interesting questions about the nature of probability and how we apply it to large-scale existential questions. Can we really use the same probabilistic reasoning we apply to coin flips and dice rolls to contemplate the fate of our entire species? And if we can, what does that say about the nature of our existence? These questions touch on deep philosophical issues about determinism, free will, and the nature of time itself. If our future is somehow set in a way that allows for probabilistic reasoning about our place in it, does that mean our actions are predetermined? Or does the very act of considering these probabilities change the outcome? It's also worth considering how the doomsday argument intersects with other philosophical and scientific ideas about humanity's future. For instance, how does it relate to the concept of the technological singularity, the hypothetical future point at which technological growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible. If such a singularity were to occur, how would it affect the probabilities the doomsday argument is based on? Similarly, how does the argument relate to ideas about space colonization and the potential for humanity to become a multiplanetary species? If we were to establish colonies on other planets, would that change the calculus of the doomsday argument? Would we need to consider all future humans, regardless of what planet they're born on. These questions highlight the complexity of applying probabilistic reasoning to something as vast and unpredictable as the future of our species. They also underscore the importance of interdisciplinary thinking when it comes to tackling these big, existential questions. Now, let's take a moment to consider some of the practical implications of the doomsday argument. While it's important to remember that this is a theoretical argument and not a concrete prediction, it can still inform our thinking about long-term planning and risk management. For instance, if we take the doomsday argument seriously, it might encourage us to place a higher priority on existential risk reduction. This could mean investing more resources in things like climate change mitigation, pandemic preparedness, or asteroid detection and deflection technologies. It might also spur us to take more seriously the risks associated with emerging technologies like artificial intelligence or nanotechnology. On a societal level, the doomsday argument might influence how we think about intergenerational justice and long-term planning. If there's a significant chance that we're closer to the end of human history than the beginning, does that change how we should allocate resources between current and future generations? Should we be focusing more on improving life for people alive today? Or should we still be making long-term investments for a future that might be shorter than we imagine? These are complex ethical questions without easy answers. But the doomsday argument provides an interesting framework for thinking about them. It challenges us to balance our optimism about the future with a clear-eyed assessment of the risks we face as a species. At the same time, it's important not to let the doomsday argument lead us into fatalism or despair. Even if we accept its premises, which, remember, many philosophers and scientists do not, it doesn't predict an imminent end to humanity. Rather, it suggests that we might be closer to the end than we think. This knowledge, if we choose to take it seriously, can serve as motivation rather than a source of hopelessness. After all, many of the existential risks we face as a species are, to some extent, within our power to mitigate. Climate change, nuclear war, pandemics, these are all challenges that we can work to address. The doomsday argument, if nothing else, underscores the urgency of these efforts. Moreover, the argument doesn't preclude the possibility of humanity achieving amazing things in the time we have left, however long that might be. Even if we're not at the dawn of a million-year future for humanity, we could still be on the cusp of incredible scientific and technological achievements. The key is to approach our future with a balance of optimism and clear-eyed realism. Now, let's take a moment to zoom out and consider where the doomsday argument fits into the broader landscape of philosophical and scientific thinking about humanity's future. It's just one of many approaches to thinking about our long-term prospects as a species. For instance, there's the field of future studies, which uses a variety of methods to forecast possible, probable, and preferable futures. Unlike the doomsday argument, which relies on a single probabilistic principle, future studies draws on a wide range of disciplines including sociology, economics, and environmental science to create more nuanced scenarios for humanity's future. Then there's the study of existential risks, pioneered by philosophers like Nick Bostrom and Toby Ord. 
This field takes a more concrete approach to assessing the threats to humanity's long-term survival, looking at specific risks like climate change, nuclear war, and artificial intelligence. While the doomsday argument provides a general probabilistic framework for thinking about human extinction, existential risk studies drill down into the specific mechanisms by which such an extinction might occur. There's also the long-termism movement in philosophy, which argues that we should be giving much more consideration to the long-term future of humanity, not just the next few decades or centuries, but thousands or even millions of years into the future. This perspective stands in interesting contrast to the doomsday argument, which suggests we might not have such a long future to consider. And of course, we can't forget the role of science fiction in shaping our ideas about humanity's future. While not a formal philosophical or scientific approach, science fiction has played a crucial role in imagining possible futures for our species, both utopian and dystopian. In many ways, the doomsday argument feels like something out of a science fiction story, a clever thought experiment that forces us to reconsider our assumptions about our place in history. All of these different approaches to thinking about the future complement each other in interesting ways. The doomsday argument provides a provocative probabilistic framework. Future studies offers more detailed scenarios. Existential risk studies focus on specific threats. Long-termism encourages us to think on grand timescales. And science fiction lets us imaginatively explore possible futures. Together, they form a rich tapestry of thought about humanity's future, one that can inform our decision-making in the present and help us navigate the challenges we face as a species. As we near the end of our exploration of the doomsday argument, it's worth taking a moment to reflect on what we've learned and how we might apply this knowledge in our lives. First and foremost, the doomsday argument serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of critical thinking and skepticism. It shows us how a seemingly simple probabilistic argument can lead to profound and unsettling conclusions. But it also shows us the importance of questioning our assumptions and carefully examining the logic behind any argument, no matter how compelling it might initially seem. The doomsday argument also highlights the challenges of applying statistical reasoning to large-scale, complex issues like the future of humanity. It reminds us that while probability and statistics are powerful tools, they have their limitations. When dealing with unique, unprecedented events like the potential extinction of our species, we need to be cautious about how we apply these tools. At the same time, the doomsday argument encourages us to think on grand scales, both in terms of time and in terms of our species as a whole. It pushes us to consider humanity's place in the grand sweep of history and to ponder our collective future. In an age where it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day, this kind of big-picture thinking can be both humbling and inspiring. Perhaps most importantly, the doomsday argument serves as a call to action. Whether or not we accept its conclusions, it forces us to confront the reality of our species' vulnerability. It reminds us that our continued existence is not guaranteed and that we have a responsibility to work towards ensuring our long-term survival. This doesn't mean we need to live in fear of imminent doom. Rather, it means approaching our future with a sense of purpose and responsibility. It means taking seriously the challenges we face as a species, from climate change to the risks of emerging technologies, and working proactively. With an amazing maiden voyage. Now, now, with all the passengers off, the official part of the maiden voyage is done. You really did great. Just deliver the bus to the depot. That's where it's stored. You, you can also get yourself a coffee there, too.
Drive slowly to one of the doors. Park the bus, and we're done. Great.